Clash of the Champions 35, the final traditional WCW Clash show to air on TBS, took place on August 21st, 1997 in Nashville, Tennessee. The show was only really hyped up over the past two episodes of Nitro. All of WCW's active championships will be defended tonight with the exception of Hollywood Hogan's World Championship, and we're also invited to Eric Bischoff's NW birthday party at tonight's event. This isn't a very long class show, only two of the seven matches featured reaches the 10 minute mark, and there's a few segments away from the ring that take up quite a bit of airtime, so this one shouldn't take too long to get through. It's a noteworthy event though, Clash of the Champions had been a cornerstone of WCW programming on TBS, but with WCW Thunder on the horizon, the Clash shows would get axed and with that we lost a great WCW tradition. But well, let's get started with Clash of the Champions 35 and we'll see how it all ended. This is part of the Reliving the War series, if you want to see the build up to Clash 35 or if you want to see what happens next, then check out the series on my YouTube channel. Double J Jeff Jarrett defends the US title against Steve Mongo McMichael in our opening match. McMichael has wanted to get his hands on Jeff since Bash at the Beach. Deborah chose Double J over Steve, so Big Mongo's out for a little payback tonight. Even though we're in Tennessee for the clash, the audience cheers for Steve. Double J does have his fans here tonight though, and they cheer after a body slam. Double J keeps the pressure on with a standing switch and a trip up. He then performs Mongo's three point stance tackle, and he adds insult to injury by chilling out on the top rope. Big Steve better sort this out pronto. Double J struts and this just annoys Mongo. Tony Schiavone says this is likely Double J's strategy to throw Mongo off his game, and it's working. McMichael talks smack to a few fans and Double J takes advantage, the crowd wants to see Steve on offense, and there it is, they pop for Mongo's clothesline, Double J then slides out of the ring after an Irish whip, and then we take a commercial break. When we come back, Double J throws McMichael into the ring steps, twice, and back in the ring, Deborah helps Jarrett while Steve was at the ropes. Big Mongo then takes a suplex, and Double J slows it down even further with a sleeper hold. Mongo raises his hand to show he's still in the match. Mongo gets up, he applies a sleeper of his own, and then Deborah gets on the apron to distract Randy Anderson. Eddie Guerrero, Double J's latest best friend, tries to help out, but he ends up hitting Jarrett with the US title. Mongo then pins Jeff and Steve McMichael is the new United States Champion. After celebrating a little, McMichael gets approached by his wife and she tries to take the belt away while saying she knew Mongo could do it all along. Steve tells her to F off and the crowd pops again. The match wasn't good, but the audience loved it. Big Mongo McMichael's bringing the championship gold to the four horsemen. Someone needs to do it. Mean Gene Okerlund stands at the entranceway and he's going to conduct an interview. Clash of the champions, you say? More like Das Wunderkind clashing his bratwurst into my face. Two. Oh, big bratwurst. Alex calls the Nashville fans losers and he tells them to shut up. Mean Gene tells Alex he's in America so he has to speak English. Alex says whatever and he proceeds to speak German. Alex has a joke for Mean Gene though. Do you know why they call Alex's opponent the ultimate dragon? Because Alex is going to drag his butt from one corner of Nashville to the other. Mean Gene's reaction's great. Alex should have said he'd be ultimately dragging these nuts across his opponent's face, but anyway, Alex says dragon and the fans have something in common, they're all losers, and that's how the promo ended. Epic stuff, promo of the year. So the next segment features Mean Gene talking with Claude Mann and Paul Gilmartin, hosts of Dinner and a Movie. A little cross promotion here it seems, Dinner and a Movie was on the TBS Superstation. These two would cook dinners while a movie played on the channel, their meals would always be themed around whatever movie was playing, and I got all that information from a 10 second google search because I honestly have never heard of their show. Dinner and a Movie wasn't one of those things that crossed over the pond and I'm not sure how popular this was in the states, I'm sure you'll all let me know. The lads are making something special for tonight and tomorrow night they're making some jerk chicken while Steve Martin's The Jerk airs on TBS. Raven's gonna have his WCW debut match next against Stevie Richards. 
Before the match gets underway, Raven says if he's gonna wrestle this match, then it has to be no disqualification. Richards agrees, so here we go. Shivani says Raven has still not signed his WCW contract as the two go to work. Raven does some damage, bringing Stevie from corner to corner before Richards gets tossed out of the ring. Raven then hits a plancha as the commentators talk about Raven's history with ankle injuries and how he has to wear a lifted right boot when performing in the ring. Richards tries to steal it with a backslide, but Raven makes Big Stevie cool pay with a few hard strikes. Stevie again gets thrown out of the ring and Raven performs a running hip attack to keep Stevie away. Raven then performs a Mick Foley-esque elbow drop from the apron, and then Raven brings a chair into the ring. He sets it up and he performs a drop to hold on Stevie. Richard sells it brilliantly, but Raven isn't done yet. He performs a bulldog on the chair next, and the crowd loves it. ECW chants have broken out at a WCW event. The chair gets set up in the corner, but Stevie counters the Irish whip and Raven takes the bump. Raven's still back on his feet before his opponent though. Richards fights back with a few rights and lefts, Raven takes a running forearm and a sidewalk slam, but Stevie's unable to get a three count. Stevie goes for the Stevie kick, Raven catches it. Stevie dodges the even flow, but Raven kicks out of the follow up pin. Raven hits a gut shot and there it is, even flow DDT. Raven pins Richards and he wins his debut match, and it wasn't bad either. Stevie, on the other hand, didn't get much of a chance to show what he could do, but this match really was put together to give fans a small taste of what Raven was all about. Granted, it's a watered down version of Raven we see in WCW, but it's Raven nonetheless. Mike Tanay says he and WCW have been putting together some videos on Mexican Lucha Libre and during those recordings, Mike Tanay got a chance to talk with Ultimo Dragon. A video then airs on The Clash where Mike Tanay talks about Dragon's history, how he was initially rejected by New Japan Pro Wrestling and how he found success in Mexico, how he ended up winning the J-Crown and how he impressed WCW fans from the first day he appeared in the company. Dragon then says there's been a translation error in his name thanks to him wrestling in Japan, Mexico and the United States. In the States, he's been known as Ultimate Dragon, but his name is actually, of course, Ultimo Dragon. It's then claimed that Ultimo Dragon was the last student of Bruce Lee. It's incredible how many sources online believe this is true. Bruce Lee died in July of 1973, Ultimo Dragon was born in December 1966. So if Ultimo learned the way of the dragon at 6 years old, then he must have been quite the student. Ultimo Dragon's in action though, next to Clash of the Champions and his opponent is none other than… Oh my god, Mordos Wunderkind at Clash of the Champions, I need to change my underwear. Oh, big blacklist. A double dose of Saturday Ride Fever this week, my my. Alex is like, fuck your Bruce Lee training when he delivers a hip toss to Dragon. Tony Schiavone can't stop saying Ultimo Dragon with the proper pronunciation, but he's gonna give that up by the end of the match. Alex performs a snapmare, and again, he can't believe how easy this is. Dragon counters a headlock with a top wrist lock. Alex then performs a sweet counter to free up the wrist, but the crowd stays silent. Alex then shows his god tier wrist action, but Dragon's just as good. Alex makes it to the ropes, Dragon gives a clean break, and Alex gets in a cheap shot or two. He tries a shoulder block, but Dragon doesn't move. Wright challenges Ultimo to do the same thing, and Alex gets floored. A simple spot, but the crowd loved it thanks to Wright acting the bastard throughout the early portion of the bout. Dragon doesn't fall for an Alex Wright monkey flip, and Daz Wunderkin takes a few chops in the corner. We see the Ultimo Dragon corner headstand and mule kick, and then we see the kick combo. Dragon then kicks Der Shiza out of Daz Wunderkin before going for a chin lock, but Alex counters with a jawbreaker. Dragon then takes a power bomb, but he doesn't go for the pin afterwards. The commentators put this down to Alex's inexperience and age. Alex hits a backbreaker, he delays the cover, and he only gets a two count. Clash then takes another commercial break and we come back to Dragon getting locked in a sleeper. He fights out but he goes back down after a jumping clothesline. Alex then hits his top rope one foot stomp. We then see some Saturday Ride Fever and Alex goes straight back to the sleeper. Dragon gets back up and just like the Double J and Mongo match, the crowd pops when Dragon puts in a sleeper of his own. Not the Dragon sleeper though. Alex tries to counter with a back suplex but it's Dragon who ends up hitting the move. Alex remains determined and he does eventually hit 
hit that back suplex. He then tries to go back upstairs, but he gets drop kicked out of the ring. Dragon tries a plancha, but Alex sees it coming, and Ultimo Dragon hits the floor hard. Still, Alex ends up getting his head smacked off the guardrail, and we see the Asai moonsault. Dragon then goes up for his top rope Frankensteiner, but Alex tries to counter it. Dragon manages to perform a front suplex from the top, but he can't put Alex away. Dragon tries a handspring back elbow, but Alex again sees it coming. He's clearly done his homework because he also counters the Tiger suplex. He then hits a German suplex, and there you have it. Alex Wright is the new TV champion. The heel turn had served Alex well so far. He's now won two singles championships in WCW. And keep in mind, he only dropped the cruiserweight belt under a week ago on WCW Saturday night. The best match on the card so far, though, this one was pretty good. Two title bouts so far and the belts have changed hands in both matches. Eddie Guerrero must be feeling confident as he tries to win the cruiserweight title next when he takes on Chris Jericho. Eddie tells Chris he's in trouble after hitting a snapmare takeover. Chris gets up and he tries to get the crowd pumped up, but that doesn't work too well. Guerrero brings Jericho to the mat, but Chris comes back with two arm drags and a dropkick. These looked great. Eddie accuses Jericho of hair pulling and he even gives Mark Curtis a demonstration. Mark questions Jericho and there's a bunch of snitching fans at ringside saying Jericho didn't do anything wrong. Eddie doesn't appreciate these fans. Chris performs a shoulder block and he catches Eddie for a press slam. Eddie then gets lifted high in the air and after he crashes to the mat, he crawls to Mark Curtis looking for some sort of help. There's nothing our favourite referee can do. Eddie takes a time out and Jericho talks a little shit. Guerrero takes advantage when Chris talks to Curtis and Eddie manages to land a jumping back elbow. He follows this up with his apron sent on and then we see a Frankensteiner. Chris kicks out at two. Eddie goes for a springboard Hurricane Rana but it gets countered with a powerbomb. Jericho then performs a giant swing and Eddie doesn't comically sell it the way he did on Nitro. But what is slightly comical is Chris missing the next spot. A spot that he's successfully performed plenty of times times before. I like how Eddie points and laughs at his opponent and these dudes right here thought it was great too. Chris makes up for it by suplexing Eddie back to the outside before the two get in the ring. The back and forth action continues with Eddie hitting a superplex and a few counters result in Chris hitting a great release German suplex. Eddie gets back up and he lands a middle rope springboard sunset flip and a few counter pins afterwards results in Chris Jericho winning the match. Eddie's not too happy with the outcome so he drop kicks Jericho and Luke your dad missed the dropkick because he was too busy trying to get on TV. Eddie hits a brain buster, he places the belt on top of Chris, and Guerrero hits the frog splash. This was better than their Nitro match from a few weeks back for sure, but there's better Jericho vs Guerrero matches out there. The nature of this class show means they were kinda rushed here. Next we had a Lucha Libre 8 man tag, heel team Silver King, Psychosis, Viano 4 and Viano 5 versus good guys Liz Mark Jr, Juventud Guerrera, Super Kolo and Hector Erector Garza Jr. As usual let's cover a few high spots. Here's Hector Guerrero pulling off a tornado arm drag, a sweet super kick from Psychosis to Juventud Guerrera, and some tandem work here from Viano 4 and Silver King led to the usual over the top rope spots from all contenders in the match. I like how Viano 5 just said fuck it and he dived onto Viano 4. Juventud jumped off Garza's back for a move Mike Tanay called Air Hoovy, and Hector pulled off his corkscrew dive from the top rope. Again, his target was pretty big, so there was no way he was messing it up. Kolo tried to hit a hurricane and Rana on Psychosis, but Sonny Ono helps Psychosis out a little. We see the guillotine leg drop and the heel team wins the match. Silver King looks downright psychotic after the bout. Not a bad match, but again, very short. We go back to Mean Gene and the dinner and a movie guys and Claude lets us know what the boys have cooked up. Mean Gene can't believe it, these two absolute mad lads support the NWO. Turns out that they're actually pretty big fans of Randy Savage. The Macho Man joins Paul and Claude as Mean Gene gets food thrown on him. Savage says dinner and a movie passed the test and these lads are NWO for life. Savage was the one who invited these two over to provide catering for the NWO birthday party. Savage then says Hollywood Hogan can't be here because he's filming a Hollywood movie <laughs> in Montreal. <laughs> Seriously though, Eric Bischoff said on Nitro that Hogan would be here, even though WCW knew for a fact that he wouldn't be. We see clips of Savage on the Dinner and a Movie show, we go back to the arena where an NWO cake now sits on the table, 
and a phantom arm pops out to light the sparklers. Mean Gene gets pushed away and then DDP shows up. Paige wrecks the set, he flips the table, ruining a perfectly good kick too may I add, and then he hits Paul with a diamond cutter. Paul takes it like a chomp too. A big waste of time, absolutely, but still a little entertaining. It's already time for our semi main event, Six and Conan representing the NWO versus Ric Flair and Kurt Hennig. The story here has been going on since Hennig showed up in WCW. Ric Flair wants Kurt to join the Four Horsemen, but Kurt won't give an answer. Hennig has helped the Horsemen, he's helped WCW, and he's also inadvertently helped and gotten help from the NWO. So nobody knows which side he's on, and really, it's dragged on a bit with no real twists or turns happening in the story. Line. Conan and Kurt started off with a few hammerlock counters. Kurt goes down after a shoulder tackle, but he pulls off a drop toe hold. Both men get back to their feet, and it's then wrist lock counters. Neither man gets the advantage, so Conan tags in six. Kurt puts Waltman in a wrist lock before tagging in Slick Rick, and the crowd are eager to see the Nature Boy in action. A shoulder block puts Rick down, and six lays in a few right hands. Flair fights back with a signature knife edge chop, but he takes a back body drop immediately afterwards. The Nature Boy gets right back up, Six takes another chop, and Flair hits his knee drop before Six takes a back drop. Hennig and Conan come back in and both men end up going down after a shoulder block. When the two get back up, Hennig's brought to the NW corner where he gets double teamed and Flair has to run in to make the save. Randy Anderson allows Flair to stay in the ring. The Nature Boy focuses on Conan while Kurt goes after Six, but then Hennig throws Six into Rick, maybe by accident, maybe it wasn't, who knows, and a figure four attempt gets inadvertently stopped. Still, Kurt's able to win the match with the perfect plex on Conan, and Flair seems happy enough to just score the victory. This match was a letdown though. Seems like the folks at Turner were a bit more eager to promote a dinner and a movie, a clash of the champions, instead of putting on longer wrestling matches. I know it's a common complaint, but 5 minutes isn't great for a tag team semi main event. After the bout, Mean Gene gets an interview and he asks the burning question, is Kurt Hennig a horseman? Kurt says no. Ric Flair wants to know if Kurt will tell the fans if he's a horseman or not. Kurt says no again, and Mean Gene tries to understand the answer. He asks if Hennig means no, he won't tell the fans, or no, he isn't a horseman, and Kurt says that's right before leaving the ring. So the story continues on, I guess. Michael Buffer's here to introduce the tag team main event. The whole NWO come out as black and white balloons fall from the ceiling. Scott Hall and Randy Savage are teaming up tonight, but Kevin Nash announces that the tag team titles will be on the line. Because it's the NWO's birthday celebration, the faction are giving back to the fans, and they're invoking the Freebird rule tonight at Clash of the Champions. Luger and Paige then come out, better known as Total Bangers on Reliving the War, and Michael Buffer says this is the first time these two have ever teamed up. Michael Buffer, or the guy riding his cards, didn't watch Nitro apparently. The NWO are sent to the back, though Kevin Nash and Elizabeth are allowed to stay. Hall and DDP are in the ring, but Scott wants Luger. So the total package gets in the ring, and those who watched the last Reliving the War will notice this match starting off the exact same way as the Nitro main event. Hall overpowers Luger to start off, but the two lock up again and Lex pushes Scott away. Hall throws Lex out of the ring and Big Sexy hits a clothesline. Nick Patrick sees it and Kevin Nash gets sent back to the locker room. Savage comes in with a top rope double axe handle, but Dallas gets tagged in when Savage misses an elbow drop. The crowd pops as Dallas takes out both Savage and Hall. The Macho Man takes a clothesline that gets the audience all excited, but Savage is able to hit a clothesline of his own, right to the back of DDP's head. Scott comes back in briefly to hit a fallaway slam, and yeah, this is the exact same as the Nitro match. Luger's trying to appeal to the ref regarding the NWO double teaming Paige, but Lex is actually causing more harm than good. It's playing out the exact same way. Macho cuts off the hot tag before throwing Dallas to the outside. Lex again argues with the referee, and this lets Scott Hall do a little damage on Paige, and it doesn't take long until the Macho Man joins in on the fun. Things don't look too good here for the total bangers. Scott's back in, he hits Dallas with a hard punch before delivering a running corner clothesline. The fans are clapping their hands and chanting for Dallas, but Hall's brought it down to the mat and it looks like all hope is lost for WCW. Scott slaps Paige around before tagging Macho 
Macho back in and <laughs> Macho delivers two kicks to a grounded DDP before tagging back out. Okay then. Page then gets a chance to make the tag when Scott gets taken out with a clothesline. And here, I like playing the audio from these main event hot tags. Oh, man oh, man. Getting up. Who's the first man to make a tag? It's Page! Lex takes out Hall and Savage, he wipes out both guys with a double clothesline, he signals for the rack, he throws Savage over the top rope before lifting Scott up for his finisher but Randy's able to dash back in and break the hold. Savage also sticks his thumb in Paige's eye for good measure and the blind DDP ends up hitting a diamond cutter on Lex Luger. Scott Hall crawls over, he covers Lex and that's the main event over. The NWO wins the match. Uh, it's one of those matches you want to enjoy and I'd love to say it was good but it's pretty much a Nitro match without the NWO running. Looks like we might see a DDP vs Lex Luger rivalry come out of this though. NWO flyers fall from the sky as we take our final commercial break. The show isn't over just yet and for many the best part of Clash of the Champions 35 is still to come. All in all though, the final Clash of the Champions show was alright. It's a decent little time waster but I wouldn't recommend it unless you were following every last thing that happened in WCW during 1997. The best match I thought was Ultimo Dragon vs Alex Wright. You really don't need to watch this one though and you'd probably be better off catching the recaps on Nitro. We come back from break and the New World Order, minus Hulk Hogan, come out to celebrate the first year anniversary of the faction that changed WCW programming forever. Eric Bischoff wants the fans to wish the NWO a happy birthday as Randy Savage says this is the best night of his life. Bischoff says Scott Hall is one of the greatest wrestlers in the world. Bischoff thanks Kevin Nash for teaching him so much and Kevin, Kevin says this. It's been sweet for the last year to be shagging in WCW. Rotten, baby. <laughs> Shagging WCW rotten. <laughs> Eric isn't going to give his teammates any more praise because it's time to get down to business. Eric says the NWO didn't get what they wanted on their birthday and that was their own TV show. Bischoff thinks this is ridiculous because if it wasn't for the NWO there wouldn't be any fans in attendance tonight. Bischoff says Hulk Hogan wants bigger limousines and newer Lear jets and it's time for Ted Turner to pay up. Just then, Bischoff's mic gets turned off as a low sustained note plays over the arena. The lights darken, the note gets louder and we see Sting in the rafters. Sting's new theme music makes its debut here and the voice of a young kid talks over the music. When a man's heart is full of deceit, it burns up, dies and a dark shadow falls over his soul. From the ashes of a once great man has risen a curse, a wrong that must be righted. He looked to the skies for an indicator, someone to strike fear into the black hearts of the same men who created him. The battle between good and evil has begun. Against an army of shadows comes a dark warrior, the prevailer of good with a voice of silence and a mission of justice. This is 